For thousands of years, Native Americans revered the spirit of the mighty river, flowing 3,740 miles from its headwaters in the heartland of America to the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. In the decades prior to the Civil War, sugarcane, the new white gold, redefines the landscape of the lower Mississippi Valley. An estimated one-third of all known millionaires live in palatial homes gracing both banks of this powerful natural thoroughfare. In 1861, English traveler Sir William Howard Russell crosses from Governor Roman's Creole plantation on the West Bank to that of Irishman John Burnside's estate on the East. A quarter of an hour brought us to the levee on the other side. I ascended the bank, and across the road directly in front of me appeared a carriage gateway with wickets of wood painted white, extending up and down the road as far as the eye could see. An avenue lined with trees led to the house, the porch of which was visible at the extremity of the lawn with clustering flowers clinging to the pillar supporting the veranda. Remarkably, this portrait of a grand plantation is with us still. Homus House, the Sugar Palace of John Burnside, is a rare treasure, capturing an extraordinary epoch in time. Tucked inside are the secrets, desires, and often conflicting whims of four centuries of owners. Like an exotic dancer wrapped in veils, she twirls through time, peeling back layers of architectural embellishments. Ornamentation appears and disappears. Her imposing figure fluctuates wildly. Cast aside like an outdated frock in the 1940s, in the roaring 20s, her curved midsection is an integral part of the tout ensemble. Between 1830 and 1880, two separate dwellings display opposing styles. In 1825, such immense grandeur is nowhere in evidence. The delicate silhouette of the front house has a West Indies flair. Slender colonnettes support a hipped roof with cabinets enclosing the gallery. The 1805 profile of the front house presents an even snugger fit, a mere three rooms of stucco-covered boussillage, mud and moss. 1775 is a good year for the stocky brick colonial. She has no rivals for her commanding view of the river. Yet even before these bricks and mortar make history, before the land grants, the claims and counterclaims, before the arrival of French explorers, South Carolina planters, the importation of slaves, sugarcane fields, and one notable Irishman, this fertile land is home to a thriving Native American community. The French call it Le Grand Homas, to distinguish it from the smaller Petit Homas. It is situated in level country. The houses or cabins surround a larger open space. The number is 60, in which may contain 200 men or warriors. This Homas nation busies itself in raising chickens and in the culture of maize and beans. Bernard de la Harpe. The Homa people are among the first families of the land, but their lives are soon radically altered. After landing at the mouth of the Mississippi in 1682, René Robert Cuvalier, Sieur de la Salle, claims all of the territory drained by the Father of Waters for France. Eager to discover the riches of the New World, French explorers and settlers make their way to a great sweeping curve in the river, guarding the entrance to the lands of the Homas. Prominent among these new arrivals is fur trader Joseph Blancpain. Blancpain quickly establishes a trading post among the Homas. It serves as a thriving gateway for commerce to the West. The 1720 census reflects this newly diversified settlement of French and native peoples. In 1758, French territorial governor Louis de Kellerec reaffirms the strategic importance of the Red Nation, the Homas. This nation is still able to furnish about 60 men to bear arms, and it is only 22 leagues above Nouvelle-Orléans. And an advanced post and barrier against our enemies, the Homas, are treated with much consideration. Five years later, the tribe's status is in jeopardy. With the signing of the secret treaty of Fontainebleau, New Orleans and the territory west of the Mississippi, including prime Homa hunting grounds, are given to King Carlos of Spain while well, the 1763 Treaty of Paris cedes control of the main Homa village to England. On October 5, 1774, the fate of the Homa's people is sealed. Appearing before New Orleans notary Andres Almonaster, Arcolabi, a metal chief of the Homa's, and business partners Alexander Latil and Maurice Conway. 
in exchange for $150 of trade goods, pots, pistols, powder, knives, mirrors, shirts, sugar, and salt. Colaby relinquishes rights to tribal lands on the east bank of the river. In the aftermath of the transaction, many Homas begin their last southern migration, crossing the river and fanning out along the bayous of South Louisiana. Back at the site of the former Homa village, new property owner Alexander Latiel settles into his two-story brick home. But by 1775, Latiel, eager to move on, sells his shares in the joint venture back to Maurice Conway. Conway, in turn, successfully petitions Spanish Governor Unzaga for access to prime Cypress timberlands to the rear of the original grant. The economic potential of this enormous 188,216-acre tract, stretching from the river to the back swamps, attracts a parade of land speculators and investors. Disputes over title to the property, collectively known as the Homas Claim, become embroiled in two congressional investigations, culminating in the longest legal battle in American jurisprudence. Shortly after the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, two Americans take up residence. History does not record why John Red Scott and William Donaldson built a new timber-framed Creole cottage almost on top of the original 1775 brick dwelling, but from these humble habitats, Homus House is born. Also getting in on the act, land baron Daniel Clark cultivates the new cash crop of sugar cane on his parcel of Homa lands. In 1806, Clark erects one of the first sugar mills along this stretch of the Mississippi. The year 1811 marks another dramatic changing of the guard as the South Carolina dynasty begins its reign. General Hampton has bought Mr. Clark's vast possessions, the homuses, with all the Negroes Mr. Clark has. The general means to bring in 400 workers to the country. I have been to the homuses on negotiations and just returned to Fort Adams. Daniel C. Holliday. The general is regarded by most as the wealthiest man in the United States. There are enormous profits resulting from the culture of sugar. A good planter may produce annually 120,000 pounds of raw sugar and 120 hogsheads or barrels of syrup. Fact, indisputable fact. William S. Hamilton, aide de camp. But it is the general's son, horse fancier Colonel Wade Hampton II, who has the greatest impact on the family's Louisiana holdings. Between 1817 and 1826, the dashing Wade Jr., a bridge builder by training, makes extensive improvements, additions, and embellishments to the house at the Homas, transforming the West Indy-style cottage into the classic revival mansion of today. When the general dies in February of 1835, he leaves an estate of over $1,600,000 to his children, including son Wade, and daughters Susan Francis and Caroline Martha Hampton. In 1840, Caroline, together with her husband John Smith Preston, journey to Louisiana. The couple arrives to oversee the vast family sugar plantations at the Homus on the east bank and Homus Point on the west bank of the river. The Prestons set up formal housekeeping in the elegant mansion designed by Caroline's brother. But their South Carolina roots run deep the Prestons are never completely at home in Creole, Louisiana. In 1848, the Prestons, along with their children, leave Homa's house, returning to the Hampton family compound in Columbia, South Carolina. The Hampton heirs divest themselves entirely of their Louisiana lands, selling to Irishman John Burnside, a self-made millionaire, revels in opulent displays. Homa's house is to be his showplace. Burnside spares no expense on the magnificent decor. Like today, ceiling frescoes and murals with exotic animals liven the grand center hall. Brilliant colors adorn the walls as crystal chandeliers, gilt mirrors, marble mantles and the finest imported furniture set the stage. Every available space is filled with intricate pieces designed to surprise and delight a steady stream of prominent guests. In the early morning, a stranger in a southern planter's house may expect the offer of a glass full of brandy, sugar and a peppermint beneath an island of ice, an obligatory panacea for the evils of the climate. 
On one occasion, Pompey brought up mint julep number three, the acceptance of which he enforced by the emphatic declaration. Massa says, Sir, you had better take this because it'll be the last he'll make before breakfast. For the next two decades, as sugarcane fuels his fortune and sweetens his lifestyle, Homa's house under John Burnside is aptly dubbed the Sugar Palace. During the Civil War, Burnside saves Homa's house from Union forces with a bluff claiming British citizenship and immunity from occupation. This successful merchant also spends a large portion of time at Burnside Place, his villa in the fashionable Garden District of New Orleans. Upon his death, Burnside's mercurial rise from impoverished immigrant to sugar baron is well noted. The deceased was born in Ireland and came to this country as a mere boy with one dollar and twenty-five cents in his pocket. He found employment with Andrew Byrne who made Mr. Burnside a partner with his son Colonel Oliver Byrne. At the time of his death, Mr. Burnside owned ten of the most valuable plantations in Louisiana. The Monroe Watchman, July 7, 1881. Saw by the paper that Mr. Burnside had left his whole fortune to Mr. Byrne between five million and six million dollars. God help the poor Mr. Byrne. Give me neither poverty nor riches, O Lord. William Portia Miles, July 13, 1881. Oliver Byrne outlives his friend, business partner, and benefactor by a scant seven years, barely long enough to sort out Burnside's vast plantation holdings. Unlike Burnside, Oliver Byrne marries and has children. In 1881, Byrne bequeaths the spacious house at the Homas to his daughter Elizabeth and son-in-law William Portia Miles. Through his marriage to his beloved and charming Betty, Miles, a scholarly and shrewd businessman, successfully oversees the growth of the Burnside Byrne fortune. The Miles Planting and Manufacturing Company produces upwards of 20 million pounds of sugar a year. Miles's son, Dr. William Portia Miles Jr., follows in his father's footsteps, managing the family business until the bottom drops out of the sugar market in the years leading up to World War I. The Great Depression, levee setbacks, floods, a new river road, and modern industrial complexes making inroads as neighbors all take their toll. Despite these upheavals, the Miles family continue to live in their cherished family home. While born of the traditions of many cultures, French, Spanish, English, and Irish, Homa's House still honors the name of the first inhabitants of the land. Their spirits mingle with the many families who have made Homa's House their own. Today, the splendor of the Sugar Palace lives on. Your host, a 21st century Irishman, pays tribute to his 19th century Irish predecessor, Sugar Baron John Burnside, with this magnificent restoration. Here, surrounded by lush tropical gardens and a majestic avenue of ancient moss-draped oaks, we invite you to savor the mystique of Southern living at its finest. Welcome to Homa's House, the crown jewel of the great Mississippi River Road.